Hey, this is Tandy with Common Ground Alaska. I'm so glad you joined us today. I am sitting here visiting with Rachel from Abundant Life Farm, and it has been fascinating learning about um, their farm and, and what they're doing there. Primarily, we're, we've been talking about the family milk cow. And having a family milk cow in Alaska definitely has its challenges, but I think the rewards outweigh the challenges. So let's talk with Rachel and let's dig into the details. Rachel, I'm so glad you're here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely. So first tell us about your family. Um, so my husband and I are um, transplanted military family. Um, we got up here in 2014. Um, I have always been an animal lover. He grew up, his grandparents had, uh, cows just for like tax purposes in Texas. And then, um, yeah, we moved up here, um, for our first anniversary. Uh, I found, uh, a goat dairy that, I wanted to, I don't know, just to fun of help the, the farmer milk their um, goats, which happened to be Mike and Susie Crosby. Um, oh, I didn't know this connection. That's awesome. She yeah, is amazing. She is amazing. And uh, that's kind of how we got started with, um, with a farm here in Alaska. But Br Brady and I have always been passionate about having a farm um, specifically to help educate kids to help build stronger families and that's something that has been basically like the foundation of our relationship and um, we've always trusted God to like lead in that direction and then um, it's kind of unfolded and here we are. I love that. That is so, that is such a perfect summary of, of how you got to the place you're at now. I love that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so tell us a little bit about your farm currently. Okay. So currently we have, um, three cows, we have three horses and chicken math number of chickens. And then we also have, um, our five dogs. Okay. Wow. All right. So you have three cows and, um, are those all milk cows or do you, are you raising out steers? They are all milk cows. Um, so our one that is currently in milk, she's due to calve in June. We're working on drying her up. Um, she is a Jersey Dexter. And then, um, this fall winter, we, um, got two Jersey sisters. Uh, one is 10 months and one is nine months and they're full Jersey. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're not getting milk from them at all quite yet. Nope, not yet. So currently we only have one cow in milk and then, um, she will calve again in June. Um, and then we will be breeding our Jersey girls for like a year from now, babies. Okay, perfect. That's awesome. Yeah. And then you'll have milk coming out your ears. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm so excited. I can imagine. That's great. So what made you want to have a family milk cow? So like I said, we started with um, goats and they were great. They're escape artists. And you have to find the animal that works for your family. Some people absolutely love goats and I 100% support that. Um, for us, goats just didn't super work. <laughs> um, and we came across cows um, actually after 2020. Um, we were thinking about having our third baby and um, we were, you know, I was like, I have always been like a not enough uh, or low supply mama. And so um, I wanted a way to supplement. And um, with the pandemic and everything going on, I wanted something that was on our farm. And we also wanted food stability. And so with our first, um, uh, those checks that they mailed out to everyone, 
we were like, you know what, we're going to get a cow. And that's kind of how it all started. So it was like, we don't want to do goats because we've kind of been there. So let's try a cow. That seems like the perfect transition. If goats don't yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. And um, we just didn't have the infrastructure for goats. And we already had like a pasture for the horses and stuff like that. And so a cow just made more sense to us. Well, that makes sense. I have planes flying over, so I keep muting while you're talking so it doesn't drown you out. <laughs> One oh, of the sorry. joys of living in Alaska, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. They're all over the place. Yes, they are. Okay, so um, I actually can, I can totally relate to your goat story. We we started with goats um, years ago, and I had bought my husband um, three apple trees. This is before we started planting the orchard, the big orchard. Um, I bought Jean three apple trees and we planted it. They were just in this, we just had this really sweet little area started where like the fire pit was there and the apple trees were there. And I had like a wildflower bed and it was just so perfect. And we had the nerve to leave for an entire day. We left it right. Every goat owner is like, you never I know leave. where this is going. <laughs> <laughs> so we, we left and we came home. And of course we had one apple tree lived of the three and the wildflowers were decimated and um and the 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 apple trees they were young they were super young they were they might have even been that planted that year so they were super little and mm -hmm. you know those goats and I understand my daughter-in-law has goats and she has a great fence and hers never escape and you know I, I think like you said animals just fit people and goats don't fit us it's um Absolutely. but they're and they're crazy smart and I love visiting my grand goats there that's really fun <laughs> um but they just and now that we have you know four acres of of pretty intense orchard with you know for the Yupik farm and stuff there's goats just won't work for us so um so I do understand that <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah. the goat dilemma when you're trying to, when you want to produce your own milk for sure. Um, okay. So you said that you have, let me see if I have this right to your two younger ones are jerseys and your older one is a Jersey Dexter. Is that what you said? Yep. Yep. That, and um, so the older one, we can just, I'll tell you their names. It'll make it easier. Um, so the older one in milk, the Jersey Dexter is Darla. And then the next oldest is Penny. And, um, the next one is Millie and I have them on my Instagram. You have them what? I have pictures of them on my Instagram if people want to get a visual of what they look like. All right. Very good. I perused your Instagram actually. That was really fun. Okay. So, so with the one cow that you have in milk, um, so she wouldn't be, if she's part Dexter, then she's not going to give like the full Jersey amount. Do I have that right? She's going to give a right, little less. Right. So at her peak, um, she gave about four gallons. And when you are looking for a family milk cow, you're like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with four gallons every single day? Uh, her first lactation, it was super overwhelming to us. Um, now there's like, no, we need more milk because we have found so many different ways to utilize the milk that there is no waste. There's no, yes, there's still abundance of milk, but we know what to do with it now. I love that. So let's dig into that. What do you do with your milk? Okay, so um, the number one thing that you do with your extra milk is um, she obviously has to calf in order to have that baby, or she has to calf in order to have the milk. And so you feed the excess milk to the calf. Um, and we fed our calf, we did wean him a little bit early, um, but Ideally, we like to feed them up till 10 months with the idea that we're butchering them. Um, so if they're plugging away at like a gallon to a gallon and a half a day for 10 months, that takes care of like a gallon to a gallon and a half a day of milk. Sure. Um, another thing we do is um, feed it to our chickens or we soak their grain in it. Um, they have become snobs 
I'm pretty sure they would die if they had to rely on water alone. Um, not, not, they do drink water. They just do it kind of begrudgingly because they want the milk. Um, we supplement our dog's feed with it. Um, I have grown, I'm no gardener, like at all. Um, excess milk is like tomatoes love raw milk love them um people were like this is your first year with tomatoes how are you getting tomatoes like I've tried and I'm like I don't know I just water them with milk um and so that was like super helpful um let's see what else do we do um we use it I um seeded a pasture and I would just use like the leftover excess um whey or milk um, and just put it out on the grass and it just flourished. So you, um, and then, you're, you're using it more for animal feed and almost as fertilizer then you're using. Yep. So fertilizer, animal feed, and then also like, you know, the human consumption of um, excessively drinking it and making, I mean, let's be honest. Every person is in a family milk cow for the butter and the cream. Like, if you don't have those things, like, you're like, yeah, I have a cow. But you're in it for the butter and the cream. So we make a ton of butter. The cream gets made into um, ice cream, cream cheese, sour cream. And then I already said ice cream, but ice cream is really important. And then coffee is just just phenomenal with it. Okay. Well, that sounds great. So you're, you're using the excess. So when you're, um, when you dry off, I forget what you said, the older one that's giving you milk, you're going to be for a while without milk. That's going to be kind of an adjustment, isn't it? For sure. But what we're doing is, um, we've kind of pulled back. So we're not feeding any plants. So there's extra milk there. Um, I stopped making cheese because um, we're, you know, saving it for drinking. Our youngest, she's 17 months old, and so she drinks it regularly. So we've been, um, I would say probably about half the milk that we get each day, we freeze. And it's not, it's way better than store-bought milk, but it doesn't, it doesn't taste quite the same. Like it doesn't, um, like if there's any cream left, it doesn't um, mix back in the milk well. Um, but that's what we do during a dry period to get us through um, is we freeze it to, so we, we try to plan to have um, like 60 bags ready for, because um, we try to do 60 days dry before she uh, calves. Okay. Well, that seems to, that makes sense. And you're still having your own product and it isn't perfect, but it's, it's better, like on a good, better, best oh, scale, yeah. it's way better. Yeah. Yeah. It's still fantastic compared to store-bought. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, um, why did you choose on your, your first one is a Dexter Jersey mix and then you have your two jerseys. Why did you choose those breeds? Okay. That's a really good question. Um, and that ties very well into, um, one, we live in Alaska. There are not a lot of variants of breeds. And so um, you have a lot of Heinz 57 cows, meaning, you know, it's got like, I think it has Guernsey. I think it has Holstein. I think it, you know, like all of these, and they're great. Um, obviously, everyone, when they think of a milk cow, they're like, oh, the Jersey with the big eyelashes and, you know, the spoony, um, you know, the classic milk cow, um, they are hard to come by and they're expensive. Um, when we were getting into cows, we couldn't afford that. We had, um, you know, different debt, you know, we, ha we weren't in a place financially to afford the classic milk cow. Um, and so we bought what we could afford. Um, do I regret it? No. Do I want to help people make a better choice than we did? Yes. Um, we found her. She was a uh, 
basically an untouched. She wasn't basically, she was untouched a cow who was in a pasture and the lady told me oh yeah um she's pregnant she's probably gonna have her baby I don't know this was in like December of 2020 she's like oh yeah she's probably gonna have her baby you know I don't know March or April I was like oh that'll be perfect and um we went to go see her and she's like you know what I think she's due sooner turns out she had her baby the end of January um she wanted to keep the baby and so we were like oh that's okay um she long story short the calf died during birth Mm -hmm. um so here we are with this freshly calved untouched new milk cow um we couldn't afford anything more um but we knew that having a milk cow was super important to us um so we put her in this small pen And we made a makeshift squeeze chute and it took probably an hour just to catch her, just to catch her. But we were so like uh, stubborn, I guess, (laughs) that we were like, you know, we, we want this and this is very important to us. And she did calm down, but it, it's not an ideal way to start. And there were more days that I was ready to give up than I wanted to keep going because it was hard. And my cow, who I thought was supposed to lick me and moo when she saw me, she hated me, you know? And, but she gave us milk and we fell in love with the milk. And she now, she's very she's not like super personable she's not she's not still not the classic milk cow but she feeds our family she's an excellent mother and um she's taught us so much we don't really necessarily believe in mistakes as long as you learn from them and I wouldn't say that she is a mistake but she is what we could afford and what was available at and she has been a blessing to us. But moving forward, we knew that we didn't want a Dexter mix. We wanted to go the full Jersey because the Dexters, they are dual purpose. And a lot of people um, use them for milk and it's, it's great and it works for them. However, um, they're udders are not as pliable as like a Jersey udder. I, I don't know how to explain it then other than like, you just have to feel the difference. (laughs) Um, their udders are a lot meatier. And so it, it, it takes more hand strength to melt. Um, they give a smaller output and they actually have a smaller lactation window. A Jersey can still be in milk for 10 months or longer, Um, but in those 10 months, you will get more milk versus the Dexter will climb up there. And then instead of gradually slow down, they usually crash. Oh, wow. um, If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so when you're reliant on milk to feed your family and to feed your farm, you want something that has maybe a high increase, but a gradual decrease, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make Um, sense. I wouldn't dissuade someone who wanted a Dexter Jersey mix. I think that they are great. It just, you have to really do the research of what fits your family. Um, And you're not going to know what fits your family until you try and see. That makes sense too. So, so on that note, so you've talked about how the Dexter tends to kind of drop off um, milk production before, um, like when you're getting ready to dry her off or whatever. Um, but so, and a Jersey sounds like it, it, it keeps you in consistent milk for a little, there's a lot, lot more consistency. So, and there's do, way more cream and there's way more cream. Yes. That's, that's good. <laughs> so, so if a person were, if someone is brand new to this and they're just, they really want to get a cow, um, but they're not sure 
not sure exactly what they want. I, I mean, I, I think probably from the sounds of it, you definitely recommend a Jersey, but um, what do you have other breeds that you kind of like for a milk cow or um, is that right? Yeah. I'm stepping I, out of your knowledge. Here. I'm, I'm not a, I prefer Jersey mm-hmm. myself. However, there are so many other breeds that work well. Um, the issue is finding them in Alaska. Um, you are going to get a lot of Jersey Swiss or uh, a Swiss Holstein, which is fine. And that totally works. Um, there is no bad cow. There's only a cat, there's a, but there is a, an ideal cow that fits your family. Um, and what I would suggest for people is, uh, you know, we thought we wanted Highland for a long time. Or, you know, and then I was like, well, I want Jersey, you know, because that's like what you were supposed to get. And that's not why we went with Jersey. Um, it is because they are, they have more breed. But there are other great breeds. Um, I personally really like Guernseys. Um, Swiss, they are great. Um, they are very big. Holsteins are very big, um, which is great, but you also have to consider a bigger cow is bigger input, more money that you have to put in. How big is your family? Do you have 12 kids? Because then a Swiss is absolute Swiss Holstein or Swiss or a Holstein is absolutely up like in your realm of what you need but if you have like a family of two kids and two adults you are going to be extremely overwhelmed with the output of a whole scene or a swiss um and so i don't think there's an ideal breed there's an ideal breed for what your family um and i'm not going to tell the family with two kids that they shouldn't get a whole scene because if they like the personality and they like the height and all of that of a whole scene, then they should absolutely go with that. Just know that they are going to literally be swimming in milk. Um, and, you know, other factors too, like, you know, what kind of cream do you like and how much cream do you like? Um, there are cows breeds that are better designed for making milk, I mean, for making cheese, sorry. Um, so there's just, all kinds of different factors. There are people um, that like having a beef breed, like um, not necessarily a dual purpose, but like a Jersey Angus or a Holstein Angus, because that um, gives them like meatier babies, but um, like a smaller milk supply, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, So it's just finding what fits your family. Um, mostly, at least in my experience, um, I got caught up in the idealism of you go out, you milk the cow, like, obviously, like, that's all there is. There is so much more to it, and it is overwhelming, and finding someone who can mentor you in not necessarily this is the breed of cow that you need to do, but in a, here are the pros and cons of it. And here is hands-on experience of, you know, this is how you milk a cow. And, you know, you can say, oh, I'm gonna get a milk machine, but what if the power goes out? Your cow still needs to be milked. And having someone, having that hands-on experience to see if you like it, to to get your feet wet before committing. That is so important in getting, in being successful with a family milk cow, because then you know um, what works and what doesn't. I, you know, we we ended up helping my Kinsuzi for almost, I think it was over a year every Sunday. And I knew from that experience that I liked Delta. I didn't really like other breeds of goats, but 
I can tell you that if you ask me what is your preferred breed of goat, it's alpine because they're easier to handle in all of these different things. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's the only goat that you should get. Um, but it gave me that, Susie gave that hands-on experience that helped me know, do I want to do this? Do I want, you know, is it, is it the lifestyle that I want? And that is something that Brady and I are super passionate about of, oh, you want a cow? That is great. You know, like come help milk our cow and see what it's like and, and experience it. So, and I think that is so important for anyone, no matter what it is. I like that. So, um, so you packed a lot into, there's just a ton of information. Um, I want to, I want to share, no, don't, I mean, this is perfect. So I want to share, um, Jean and I are talking right now. What we're doing is, um, we're transitioning, um, from, we're not going to have egg chickens anymore because we're tired of wintering animals. We've done it for so many years and we kind of like to be able, we kind of feel like the farm keeps us busy in the summer. And that if we can grow, if we, we are super content, if we can just grow, um, chickens for me and pigs for me, cause you can do those in one mm-hmm. season. Um, but then once in a while we talk about, Oh, wouldn't it be nice to have a milk cow though? Um, and it was funny because I just interviewed Elijah Lockwood a couple weeks ago he, or a couple days ago. He, we just posted his, um, yeah, his I just interview. That this morning. Oh yeah. On milk, on the cow milk shares. And, um, and that was fun. Um, but he brought up interesting points too. Like, um, he brought up the, the, um, the, um, distance from the ground. Like he mm-hmm. said yes, for him, yes. it's much nicer having a taller cow. He's, he's not a short guy, you know? And so for him having a taller cow, even though he uses the machines and stuff, it's just, it's a lot, um, nicer for us. We've talked, um, we have leaned, are leaning towards a Highland type cow because, um, we don't have a lot of pasture. We have a lot of land, but we don't have a lot of pasture mm-hmm. and they are, they're good at foraging. They're better at foraging mm-hmm. than, um, than a lot of cows would be. So, um, so it really does depend on yes. your family and what works best for you and doing that research, even like you said, little things like how far it is from the ground. And, um, you know, if you're going to have a hard time, another thing that I heard recently was, um, if you're planning to hand milk, then it's best not to get a cow that's been milked on a machine its whole life. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I can see merit to that. However, um, at even when you machine milk a uh, a cow, they're still getting the you know you still have to strip the milk by hand beforehand to cleanse out the milk that's in the udder and to get the bacteria out. And then you also strip the udder after your. So they do still have um, hands hands on. I'm not super sure, um, like the robotic dairy, I'm not sure how that works, but I know in like, when I grew up in Minnesota in conventional lower 48 dairies, um, they strip out the milk by hand, they put the machine on, and then they make sure the udder is empty by, by, um, stripping. Um, I don't know with robotic dairy if they touch the udders I'm not sure um I could see how that would be an issue a problem my friend in Fairbanks um she got some cows from a dairy she had a little bit of they had a transition um but she was able to work through it and it could be because she was already an experienced milker Uh um so I would say that for a newbie, uh, for someone just starting out, um, hand milk is hand milk is best. Um, most people are going to take the plunge and get that purchase of the milk machine. However, post COVID, um, they run minimum about two thousand dollars. Oh my! <laughs> and word. that's just the purchase price, not the shipping. Um, so there's also that to keep in mind. Um, I wouldn't, if having a cow is important to you, I wouldn't discount the cow because it's only been machine milk. 
it is workoutable, but you have to be willing to put in the sweat equity. Okay. That makes sense. So another thing, another question that I have specific to a family milk cow is um, something that I don't know that people really consider. And I haven't seen a lot of, a lot published about this. I'm just kind of hearing it as I'm talking to more and more um, cow keepers or dairy farmers or whatever you want to call it. Um, that every cow to keep them in milk, you have to rebreed them, which means you have a period of time without milk. So Elijah was talking about how he staggers his um, he staggers the birthing so that he can stay in milk. And, um, and it sounds like that's kind of what you're going to be doing too, is, is staggering. So you can continually have milk. Although that means that sometimes you've got an abundance of milk when everybody's, when yeah. everybody's giving. Um, but that's just, so, so either if you're considering a family milk cow, either you need to be prepared like you have done um, by freezing some of the milk for drinking for a couple months or have more than one cow. So you can stagger that, um, that breeding yeah. time so you can cons consistently have milk. So let's talk about schedules a little bit, because I kind of think it'll answer this question. Um, so you get a cow, you breed her, she's pregnant for about nine months, ideally 60 days post calving, you rebreed her. Um, so then you want her to be in milk for a total of 10 months. It can be, you know, ish, ish. Um, so what you can do is you can either have two milk cows and stagger them so that they're two months. Um, so let's say, We'll use Penny and Millie, for example, because that's what we're going to do with them. So um, Penny, we're going to breed ideally next month. So I guess in March, we're going to breed her in March. Ideally, we will breed Millie in May so that we have uh, Penny in milk and she's in milk for two months before we then have a second cow who is in milk. And this is all on strategy because you know, uh, we're going to be AIing our, our girls. And so the AI has to take the first time in order for this theory to work. Um, but it usually, it, it usually pans out, give or take a month. Um, and so that way you will always have a cow in milk. You'll probably have two, but you'll always have a lighter, milking period um and that's okay and you know that works and you can do that I would say for most people um most families they are going to have probably one cow with her calf um and so they will melt they will have a dry period um and in that dry period, they can save their milk. Uh, previously, that is when we go on vacation because it's easier to get a farm sitter with a dry, you know, uh, just throw hay and make sure there's water and you're good. Um, and so that is your block of time that you can go to Hawaii or <laughs> you can go get some sunshine somewhere. Hopefully it is. Or, you know, other people schedule it for around dip netting or around hunting. So they don't have to worry about it. Um, and you can absolutely schedule your life and your cow to accommodate your needs. For example, my husband is a shift worker. Um, it is not feasible for us to do a 5 a.m. and 5 p.m., a 6 a.m. and a, you know, like we, we're not the classic get up, you know, at 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or even 7 a.m. Um, we milk at 11 a.m. and 11 p.m. because that's what works for us. Um, now, could I buy a cow in milk and make her do that without some repercussions? Absolutely not. You can gradually work to make that schedule work for you and your cow will acclimate to it. They are a cow of routine or they are an animal of routine. And when you deviate from that, you will get repercussions. It's not might, you will. Um, <laughs> either they will 
um, say, you know, like, what the heck, like, where were you? Um, they might be a little more pushy. They might, um, you know, not kick you, but they might, you know, pass the bucket. Um, cows are very personable and they will tell you when you are not on schedule, but when you make the schedule that works for your family, then there's no, um, there's no one schedule that you have to do with the cow. You don't have to get up at 6 a.m. if you don't want to. Um, if your cow gets out at 6 a.m., then yeah, you have to get up. But as far as the milk schedule, you make the milk schedule that works for you. Um, 11 a.m. and 11 p.m., that works for us. Um, a big, another thing that kind of, it'll probably segue into another question, um, is once a day milking. You can get by with once a day milking if you calf share. But to me, when you do once a day milking, you are dancing with mastitis. And that's something that I want to stay so far away from because that is at risk of losing your investment and losing your food source. And that's just not something that I want to mess with. Um, the drawback of calf sharing and for those that don't know, calf sharing is you leave the calf with the cow either all day and then you milk in the, uh, you milk. So I'll just say how we did it. Um, we leave the calf with the cow all day, put him up at night and milk in the morning. You can absolutely do that. And that work has worked for so many people. There are drawbacks. Um, they hold back milk and you can't hold that against them because they're just being good mamas. And when they hold back milk, they're holding back the cream. So to calf share, you sacrifice most of your cream. Um, but you get more freedom. So do you want freedom or do you want cream? Personally, I'm in it for the cream. So I will sacrifice my time versus my cream. Um, and that's just, you make the schedule that works for you and there, we could have a whole podcast about calf sharing and the pros and cons of it. Um, but so for now I will just hit on, that is an option that you can do. And we could definitely talk about that more. Um, but yeah, that is definitely an option, okay. but you make the schedule that works for you and your cow will make you stick with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's a good thing. Got to have accountability, right? <laughs> right. Absolutely. Um, okay. So I want to get into numbers a little bit. First of all, how okay. much space do your cows need as far as, I mean, like, are you like rotationally grazing them? Do you have like massive fields or, um, are you, are they in a small area with hay supplement? I mean, I realized in Alaska, actually I had someone I used to do when Point McKenzie was open, I ran one of the big milk share. I'd go get milk for a ton of people and bring it out mm -hmm. to, you know, civilization. Cause we live not far mm -hmm. from Point McKenzie. Um, and then they'd pick it up and, and the farmer actually gave me my milk for free for giving him all these customers and, and bringing their milk to him. For so sure. that was kind of cool. But I had a lady call me and she said, I only want grass fed milk. And she said, are those cows, this was like December, January, February. And she said, I have to know those cows are on pasture right now. And I said, well, wait, like on pasture, <laughs> like, and I looked out the window and I thought, okay, um, let's talk about this for a second. And she said, nope, I will only drink milk from the, I said, I will only drink milk that's grass fed or I'll just go to the grocery store. And I thought, pasture fed. She wasn't saying grass fed. She was saying, you know, it's not like hay, like we were supplementing hay in the winter. She said, Nope, I will only drink if it's pasture fed or if it's from the grocery store. And I, I still, I'm sure there was a miscommunication somewhere. I just wasn't understanding, her sure. question, but I had to kind of chuckle. And, um, so I'm curious, do you grab, do you pasture feed in the winter? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So no, but also kind of as a question back to that is like, if you eat salads in the winter, do you only eat garden fresh salads? Like, it's not feasible for us to eat garden fresh salads unless we have like a really nice indoor greenhouse, which I don't, I mean, I there might be one in Tokina or something like that, but like, 
it's not exactly feasible even for humans to do that. And so what do we do? We either import it or we eat from our freezer or from our canned goods source. And when people say, oh, I only want grass fed, think about, okay, you want like that fresh tomato, so you freeze it or, you know, freeze dry it or whatever. We're doing the same thing with the hay. The hay is grass fed. Right. Um, we currently, and this, uh, we currently live on 30 acres. Um, our property is extremely hilly. And we have a winter patch, a winter paddock, where we have the horses and the cows together. I don't know its exact size, um, but we want them close to us in the winter because moose can tear down fencing and steal the hay and injure the animal. So we want them close to the house. Um, we do have plans to rotationally graze as we can next year um but again our property is it's very very hilly we basically live on a bluff um it's very like there and it's heavily treed so there's not a lot of lush grass um and that's something that we're working on um property terrain in alaska is this whole other topic but um you don't have to have a lot of space to have a cow. Um, they have to have enough room to kick up their heels if they want to. And I mean, I wouldn't keep them in a small, um, you know, like a small stall or whatever. I will say for Darla's first eight, maybe six months with us, she was in that small stall because we could not catch her if we didn't. Um, and that is okay for a short season. We um, made sure we, you know, cleaned the, the pen and all of that. Um, it is really on like a hygiene practice um, is what is most important. So if you have a small space, you know, removing the poop and giving them fresh bedding is, is crucial to um, what your cow needs. I wouldn't say that you need a ton of space. Most books say that you need an acre and a half. Um, I've seen people do it on less with good uh, hygiene practices and they did great. Um, I would say that we probably have maybe an acre and a half for our winter pasture that we have um, for them and it works. Um, do they, do we want bigger? Absolutely. And we're getting that's fair. Um, but but the, the thing is, is you, I've heard so many people, you know, I meet them and they're like, oh, you have a farm? And I'm like, yeah. Oh, you have a cow? Oh, I want a cow, but I have to, you know, I'm saving up to build the barn and, you know, the barn costs like $20,000 and you cannot wait for perfect. You obviously, you need a shell, you need fencing that is going to hold them in. Um, you don't need Fort Knox like goats. As long as they know where the feed comes from, especially if they're a seasoned milk cow, it doesn't matter. They will be where they need to be at milk time because they don't want to hold on to that milk anymore. Um, you don't need a perfect setup to have a milk cow. Um, we just recently put a roof on our barn uh what was it 17 below this morning when I got up all three of my cows were out just chilling in the pasture no one was under the barn at all rarely are my cows in the barn they prefer to be outside now do I think a, a shelter is important absolutely but it doesn't have to be the Taj Mahal um I I really like this one book. It's called um, The Independent Farmstead. And she talks about your your cow or any of your animals aren't going to know how much your barn costs. They're not going to care if you sweep the aisle every day. They're not even going to care, you know, what kind of flooring you have or, you know, anything like that. Because a tree suits them just well. 
just fine. Um, I think safety is important. And as long as you have that established, you don't wait for perfect to feed your family because perfect rarely comes by. <laughs> You're right about that. So, so kind of going off of that, then it sounds like you don't, so you have to supplement their feet a lot. It's not like they're spending a lot of their life grazing. So, so right. can we talk for a minute about um, cost? I, you know, so someone who's, that's one of the main questions people ask when they're considering a family milk cow, you think, you know, do I have shelter for them? And do I have room for them? There's, you know, do I have fencing all that? Um, but a major thought is, what is it going to cost? And then, you know, the next thing as a farmer, you're always thinking, how can I offset that cost or, or what benefit is going to come? If I'm going to spend this money, what's the benefit going to be? But the, but knowing the cost ahead of time is super important. Can we go over that? Okay. Yeah. So my husband put together a simple little cow math for us. And this is based on, and again, I say Jersey, but that doesn't mean that you have to get a Jersey. But when you're figuring out how much a cow needs, it's very much based on their size. Okay. So our calculations are based on a Jersey sized cow. So okay. if you had a, if you had a smaller Jersey, this would be applicable. Um, a Swiss, you're going to have to plan for more. A Holstein, you're going to have to plan for more. Um, a straight beef cow, you're going to have to plan for more. This is very, uh, it's very close for a highland. Um, so we, in feed, we uh, plan for one 600 pound round bale a month per cow. Okay. So with, in, with three cows, so, you're about a ton of hay a month. Yep. And so, um, most people uh, in Alaska, unless you own a ton of land that is already de a developed pasture, you're feeding hay 20, like 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. um, you definitely supplement with pasture if you have it. But you, especially in Alaska, because you don't know, like, is it going to rain? And there's going to, you know, you need to plan on having, needing to feed hay 20 uh 24 7 and a pasture is obviously ideal my parents live three miles away and they have it's basically a a three acre yard and so sometimes I bring my cows over there to like have a reprieve or a snack or something but um it's we still plan on feeding them hay 365 days a year so 160 uh, one 600 pound round bill, um, a month. So that's 15 total a year per, per cow. We figure extra because we don't know what the winter is going to be like in the, like in a harsh climate right now, you know, we're in a cold snap. So we're feeding more mm -hmm. than what we need to. Um, <clears throat> when she's in her peak of milk, we feed 10 50 pound sacks of dairy ration. Um, that's eight pounds twice a day. Uh, and so that equals out to $250 a round bill is about what we pay. Um, and then $30 per sack of grain. And I just want to hit on this for a hot second because when we got a cow, <clears throat> um, that same dairy ration cost $17. Oh my gosh. So it's doubled in this last couple of years. And now it's 30. <clears throat> and so, um, so you're looking at about $550 a month or 600, 6,600 a year. Wow. Um, so then we looked at, um, if you were to buy Fred Meyer brand whole milk, um, at the store, you know, at, as of this price, this, this, this week, it's $4 and 19 cents a gallon. You can buy, uh, 1,575 gallons of store milk per year or like four and a half gallons a week. Um, and that is equivalent to the cost of feeding this size cow. Um, 
One dairy cow, though, will produce 1,500 to 1,800 gallons of milk over a 10-month lactation. So as long as, like, I, I don't know about you, but growing up, my parents were like, no, a gallon needs to last us a whole week. Um, we go through like a gallon a day. <laughs> um, it is, it, it's a complete, it's a complete meal. You know, you don't have time, grab a glass of milk. It is a complete meal. It has vitamins, it has nutrients, it has protein, all of the different things. But if you have a big family and you know that you'd be capable of doing four gallons a week, just drinking a milk cow is definitely feasible for you. It definitely pays for itself. Um, and then there's other hidden costs like breeding, um, finding a bull to use up here for live cover is an act of Congress, um, but it ranges to like $300 if you can find it. Um, you have to pay for AI breeding and that is, again, probably, I've seen anywhere from 200 to 400. Um, vet bills. It's not if your cow gets sick, it's when your cow gets sick. You can mitigate calling the vet out because they're always going to get sick after 5 p.m. and definitely on a weekend or a holiday. Like you can pretty much whenever <laughs> we pass a holiday and I'm like, no one got sick. All right, we're good. Whew. Um, you can mitigate a lot of vet calls by educating yourself on vet care and having a supply of the essentials that you need. Um, and that greatly reduces having to call the vet for a, a vet call on a farm visit. Um, one thing that we never figured, that we never factored in was bedding. Um, dairy cows need to be clean, otherwise the milk gets contaminated. Um, and cows like to stay warm by laying in fresh cow patties. Um, so figuring out a source to get bedding, you either have to pay for it or um, use wood chips. Um, I'm, I know like Gage Tree Services, you can buy wood chips pretty reasonable there. Um, their delivery fee is like $150 or something like that. But you can go with your truck and pick it up at, and it, you can get it for free or a small number. Some people already have uh, wood chips. You can get sawmills. They have, you can get a super stack of sawdust, I think for like 50 bucks or something like that. And that's, you know, a lot of sawdust, but you're gonna, you're gonna go through it. Um, so the question is, is it worth it? Um, yes, it is worth it if you're willing to use the excess milk. One of the things is, oh my word, like it costs so much to keep the cow, but say you either calf share or we prefer bottle feeding because um, we get to keep the cream that way. Um, you basically feed that to the calf for 10 months and she, and the, the amount of hay that that calf eats, you're not really gonna notice. You're not even gonna have to do that in the head count for hay supply. Um, but you are essentially getting about 200, we, we butcher our babies when they wean. So at the 10 month mark is when we butcher. Uh, we just butchered last month and we got 200 pounds of free meat. Um, now was it free? Not really, but we didn't have to pay the $4 a pound for hamburger. But we got more than hamburger. We got steak. We got um, brisket. We got, you know, hamburger. We got stew meat. We got all kinds. Um, I have bone broth coming out my ears right now. I'm not complaining. But um, we didn't have to pay for that. Our cow provided that to us. Um, so that alone is like, yeah, it's totally worth it. Because there is nothing thing better than a cow raised on raw milk it is so delicious um, <laughs> that's good to know I actually that's when we've talked about getting a milk cow that's part of 
that's part of the strategy is because we do raise our own pigs and our own chickens for meat. And so we have a, um, we, we have a brewery that just came in not too far from us. And so, um, the goal is to approach them for, um, spent grain. And then, um, and then if we had a cow rather than later, yeah, well, we're, I'm trying, I've, I've been approaching them, but they're busy. (laughs) So they, um, so, and I, I know that, that we still, they still need food. They still have to supplement. It's not like we can just Mm -hmm. feed them spent grain and milk, but Um, But knowing that, you know, with my chickens and my pigs, that we can supplement so much of what, you know, we're raising them on um, Mm -hmm. between being able to forage because our chickens are chickens free range and our pigs Mm -hmm. free range. And um, also we have, I I mean, it sounds like a utopian world and, and, and I, it isn't as nice as, because we've done it before and it's not, it doesn't, everything doesn't, livestock doesn't stay in little boxes where we put them. Um, but yep. you know when the pigs can clear a field for us and the chickens can go behind mm-hmm. and keep all the bugs away and um then we've got this beautiful field that's been fertilized it's been cleared mm-hmm. they've done all the things um and then also when we're when they're needing to supplement you know they can have milk from the cow so that's where our extra mm-hmm. cow's milk goes it, it creates this kind of beautiful cycle that although it's not perfect because it is livestock and it's, you know, I'm human and they're livestock and we're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, It's such a better process than, Mm -hmm. than any other, any other way of, of, of attaining our food that I can think of. Um, Yeah. And, and, you know, I used, uh, you know, like we bought the grain, but we learned that, you know, we can, we're now cutting the dairy ration with 50% barley. Barley is $14 a bag and it is grown locally in Alaska. And so, you know, we are sourcing something that is locally grown. Another thing that we're doing and experimenting with, with our cows and our chickens is um, growing fodder. That greatly reduces, um, reduces the feed cost, but it also really vamps up their nutritional. And um, so you can cut corners like that and people are like, oh, I don't have time to grow fodder. It's like, well, you're not really going on vacation because you have farm animals. And even if you do go on vacation in those two dry months, you can put a pause on the fodder and, you know, um, you can make it work. Um, It is a way. And so we are always finding trial by error, finding ways to make it more cost effective to have our animals, but not at the expense of their health. Um, Their health is always of utmost importance, but um, you absolutely can make a huge cut in your, um, like chicken feed is so expensive right now. I mean, I've seen $50 a bag if you want to feed corn-free, soy-free. Um, and, you know, getting that bag, but cutting it with the raw milk plus the food scraps. Um, I told my husband how much we were spending in like chicken feed and he was like, what? Um, we started cutting, you know, cutting the, uh, the feed with, um, with milk and our egg production skyrocketed and, we just added something that we already had. Yeah. Um, and so that was something that was like, yeah, a cow has always had a permanent fixture. Or we'll always have a permanent fixture on our farm. When we first got started with cows, my husband was like, just when the kids are young and then we'll get out of cows. And now we're like, mm, no, we're going to be the grandpa and grandma with cows. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Oh my gosh. So I guess my, my final question for you, um, is, um, I know you said you don't like to talk about mistakes and neither does Bob Ross. He says, there's no such thing as mistakes, only happy accidents. He says, (laughs) So, but tell what are some, um, if you wanted to call them mistakes or just things that you wish you had known, do you have any like advice for people who are just kind of starting on this journey or they're considering it and um, you've already given us a lot. So, but if there's any things that we missed or um, any like hacks that you have that helped you along the way. Um, definitely. 
the mindset of doing it all on your own. I have talked about you can feed your chickens on your own. You can, you know, boost up your soil on your own. You can do it on your own. Absolutely. You can feed your farm and feed your family. Um, but get a mentor. Get a cow mentor because, you know, you may have been in it for a while. You may have read you know, I'm looking at four books right now that I read and nothing prepares you like the hands-on experience when your cow finds that one weakness in the fence and runs away for the whole day and you're 28 weeks pregnant and you're like, what did I do? <laughs> nothing prepares you for that. And, you know, and when, when, and I'm not saying this is going to happen with everyone's cow because most family milk cows will try to get in your house because they're that tame. But mine wasn't. Mine ran away. But she came back at milking time. You know, I scoured the countryside looking for my cow, but she came back. Um, the mistake, I mean, we have made a ton of mistakes. <laughs> um, I would say one of them is we downplayed how important minerals are. If an animal is not getting minerals, you're introducing sickness. You're introducing infertility. And when you have a cow that won't get pregnant, you then have a very expensive creature. Because if, you're, if your cow is not getting pregnant, you're not getting milk. And the whole funnel just starts. Um, minerals are super important. They keep mastitis away. They keep your, um, your animals healthy and um, they keep them fertile. They keep the pregnancy sustainable. Um, minerals are so important and quality minerals are, are super important. I would say that is something that we um, really learned. Um, let's see. I'm not. I'm not downplaying, you know, I really try to learn from my mistakes. Yes, we have made lots of mistakes, but I hope and pray that we've learned from those. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we have made lots of mistakes. Um, having a calf, you know, especially a full dairy. Um, my, I, I mentioned earlier that my husband grandparents had uh, beef cows. Beef cows are super resilient. You could feed them sticks and they will probably still make you beef. I mean, you can feed them anything. They can, and a, a dairy cow, especially a calf, is not as resilient. They take a lot of nurturing and babying and, um, because they aren't, they're not bred to be super duper herdy like a beef cow. Um, we have chosen to crossbreed our cows with beef because that makes them a little more resilient. We have lost calves because we didn't know that, well, his grandma meant well to be like, oh yeah, I'll be totally fine. It A, a little dairy calf can't do that. You can't compare Yes, they're both cows, but they're not, um, they're not cut, they're not cut the same. Um, you can't ask a chihuahua to go herd some sheep just because it's a dog. You need that specific breed to do that, if that makes sense. And that's kind of, that was, uh, another one of the mistakes that we made. Um, but you live and you learn and hopefully you don't make that same mistake again. And that's, kind of where a mentor comes back in because you know you can text them and be like dude I really failed or I really messed this up He's like, no I was there too like let me help you not make the mistake same mistakes I made and if you do make the same mistake I can help you fix it a lot easier yeah um I have and it's not just one mentor I have several 
I, you know, I have a friend in, in Fairbanks that has milk cows and I'm like, Oh my gosh, like what is going on? And you know, she'll problem solve with me. And it's super, super helpful. Um, I'm a part of a milkmaid society and a membership and it's been super helpful of like, I have a cow and I can't even make cheese. And, you know, it's like, well, have you tried this? And have you thought about this? And uh, did you know that in late lactation, there is more lactic acid in the milk? And so you have to change how much ingredients you put in to make cheese. And I was like, no, I didn't know that. And so having those mentors has really mitigated a lot of the mistakes. But we also, you know, as fellow cow people, we come together and like, hey, this is what worked for me. Um Taking advice from someone who lives in the lower 48 is not necessarily applicable to having a cow in Alaska because it is completely different. Having a cow here in the Matanuska Valley is completely different than having a cow in Fairbanks. Um, it's similar, definitely, and but it's not the same. Um, and so that's along the lines of making a mistake of like, oh, well, they did it in Texas, or, you know, I saw someone do it in Texas, or, or even Idaho, and it's like, well, that's not applicable to here, because we live in Alaska, so, and that is one thing, is that I feel so passionate about helping Alaskans um, find a family milk cow that works for them, or, you know, sharing my knowledge, because there's not a lot of information about owning a family milk cow and then owning a family milk cow in Alaska. I love that. And I think that's an excellent spot to kind of leave this. And I definitely, as, um, as a farm, that's kind of been our mission is um, we love the idea of self-sustainability. Um, and yes, we push for self-sustainability to a certain degree, but it's, it's not, we're not made for that. We're not made to, man isn't made to be an island. And so, yeah, self-sustainability is a great goal as long as you have a community behind you. So I think oh, yeah. that's super important. Everything. Oh my gosh, this has been so wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. This has been a wealth of information. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it.